Okay, so welcome. Welcome to our panel on renewable energy for Africa. If I can ask you there at the back to either come and take your seats and join us. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> That's right. So thank you very much for joining us today to talk about renewable energy for Africa, moving from talk to action. My name is Arya Green. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Gigawatt Global, a renewable energy platform for Africa. Um, I actually attended with some of the members, uh, my friends here on the panel, uh, SOCAP last year and Davos uh, in February and also the Milken Institute conference. And here we are again at SOCAP. And I know that we all have attended all sorts of conferences talking about the very, very important issues that here at SOCAP we're addressing also, whether it's uh, uh, poverty, health, education, uh, and of course, access to energy. And I will share with you in one word of introduction why we're sitting here today. Um, and that is, uh, well, in a word, frustration. I want to keep us very positive. So this is the only negative thing I'm going to say from <laughs> beginning to the end. But for years now, the world community has been talking about creating mechanisms to bring more energy access, more electricity to the poorest regions of the world. And there's been a lot of talk, and we've all been involved in that. And talk is good because talk usually can or should lead to action. But the frustration that many of us in the field, funders, NGOs, companies, banks, and activists feel is that we've spent a lot of time talking about and creating uh, the drive and the interest in promoting more energy access, especially in the developing nations and especially on the continent of Africa, and too little has actually been done. Now, turning to the positive side of the scale, there is a lot being done now. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the uh, Green Climate Fund that just announced a billion dollars in funding of different projects across the world, including some actual projects to bring energy to Africa. Many of their projects are more in creating uh, awareness and uh, uh, climate change resilience and other, and other programs. But the fact is there is interest and there is action. But there's not enough. And so we created this panel to try and address the pressing need for real action beyond just the talk. And so I'm gonna stop talking and turn to our panelists who are <laughs> leaders in actual activities, funding, NGO, advising and consulting, and uh, building the kind of energy infrastructure that's needed to alleviate the poverty, malnutrition, educational issues, promote women's empowerment, etc., throughout Africa. I'm not going to introduce them all together. I'm going to turn to each of them one by one, and at that point, I will introduce them so we can maximize our time together. I'm going to be relatively assertive, as I've shared with you as my friends, to keep us each to five minutes of opening remarks, and then two minutes of response to the remarks that have been shared, and then a full at least 30, if not 40 minutes, of discussion with you who've come here, who've expressed interest by being here with us in these particular issues. So I'd like to start, please, with you, Matt. Matt Patsky heads the Trillium Asset Management in Boston uh, Fund in Boston, Massachusetts. The firm has been deploying capital into impact investing since its founding in 1982. One of the first, before we even had the term impact investment uh, firms, to be managing funds with a values orientation. Matt and Trillium currently manages over $3 billion in funds fo focused on positive social and environmental impact. He was formerly at Lehman Brothers. He served as a portfolio manager and on the investment committee of the Green Solutions Fund of the Winslow Management Company. Currently serves on different boards relating to environmental issues and holds a Bachelor of Science in Economics from the Rennes-Lauer Polytechnic Institute. Matt, if you'll open the discussion with some observations of your own and then uh, we'll go from there. Sure. Thank you. <coughs> no, thank you. Um, yeah, <coughs> I would say the, the um, the interest in renewable energy is obviously now being driven globally by the economics of renewable energy um, and that it's become compelling uh, without subsidy in many parts of the world. And so 
we're, we're starting to see the market forces itself start to uh, come into play of, of trying to provide capital. But the, the big disconnect that I think it, we're still seeing in parts of the world is there's not enough debt capital. And so, um, and, and what's that about and, and, and how do we solve for that? And um, for, for uh, Trillium, our exposures, uh, our exposure geographically um, to Africa is through many different asset al uh, parts of our asset allocation. We, we have exposure through the traditional public markets and uh, public fixed income to Africa, but we also have been active lenders to all of the different loan funds from MCE, OICO Credit, um, to, uh, I'm trying to think of, there's a couple others that have been doing lending to organizations in Africa. We also are direct lenders to Root Capital and Shared Interest, which um, have exposure in, in uh, Africa. But um, we, are, we are ourselves not project finance oriented. We're doing it all through pooled vehicles. And so um, to that end, we, we are um, launching, actually, the documents came back from the lawyers today, so we're launching a fund of funds vehicle to finally be able to do direct or investments in with fund managers who have more direct exposure um, to the continent. So we're looking forward to being able to put more, deploy more money, but um, our, our uh, exposure in the renewable energy space right now is largely in the public markets and then through loan funds that we're participating in. Matt, you, you said the documents just came back today, so you're using this platform to announce the launch of, of this new fund of the, funds? The tr yeah, Trillium Impact Partners was launched today. So, wow, that's good. Yeah. So, um, it, we, we have done investments before in the, in the private space, but it's um, because we're a separately managed account platform um, that is administratively very complex and, uh, and not fun for the fund managers to receive money from us, nor for the way we've been booking it. And, and, and so now we'll be able to actually participate. So there are, um, there's certainly at least one, of, I mean, there, we are looking at funds and, and there are funds represented here today on stage that we are in active you know, due diligence on. So. Well, that's fantastic because I had asked everybody on the panel to have something practical to say, tangible, instead of just all the, uh, all the discussions that we've had and that's very exciting. That is really exciting, and I'm, I'm hoping to see by next year at SOCAP the kind of speed that we're talking about, that you will, you will have already used that, invested in the funds, as the fund of funds in the funds, and that the funds will have actually deployed that capital into renewable energy projects uh, in Africa. Yep. Let's hope so. Yep. I'm going to change the order of things slightly because Morgan Simon, my good friend from just around the corner, is getting on yet another plane. Um, and uh, Morgan apologizes for having to run off, but I, I'd like to ask you, Morgan, at this point, <coughs> let me introduce you um, for a second, although I know you well, I still have some notes here. Um, of course, you're the founding partner uh, of the Candide Group, um, and uh, Morgan has close to two decades of experience in making uh, finance a tool for social justice on a number of different uh, levels and, and fields. Um, in the time that you've been actively involved in this, I know that you have influenced over $150 billion of, uh, of investments in, uh, in various different um, activities and, uh, and fields. Um, you're a regularly sought out expert in, uh, in the whole issue of financing um, the, uh, the impact investment community and of course Morgan wrote uh, a book just recently, just out last year, called Real Impact, The New Eco Eco Economics of Social Change. Um, and she's been a featured uh, uh, Harvard Business School and United Nations speaker and expert. I'm very glad to have you with us. Please share us your thoughts before you run off to the, to the airport. Thanks for having me. Um, so I uh, wanted to just by a little bit more way of background. So Candide Group is a registered investment advisor. We have a, a small uh, client list of families, so more akin to a multifamily office. And we've invested in 65 companies and funds over the last six years. Um, and some of that has been both microgrid and utility um, scale energy in Africa. 
Um, and in general, we are extremely broad in terms of the sectors and geographies that we invest in. And what we're always looking for in any sector is what is the systemic intervention that we can make, that what actually solves the problem as opposed to making it a little bit less miserable to be poor or to you know, actually have the type of energy at the cost and amount that you need um, rather than some approaches that can feel like good enough for those people. Um, that's really the kind of attitude we want to be pushing back against. And that means there's a couple principles of how we think about investing in renewables in Africa um, that I wanted to share. So three, um, three points. Um, so first is really thinking about this question of affordability um, and that what we've seen um, is that often approaches have scaled because they were easy to finance as opposed to necessarily the best for people, right? So how do we make sure as investors we're really holding ourselves accountable that it's not about our needs, um, it's about the people who need energy and that a number of lanterns, home systems, where people are paying four to six dollars a kilowatt hour, where they could be getting two cents an hour um, from grid scale, how do you make sure you, know, you don't want to penalize people who legitimately need energy today, um, but you also want to make sure that you're providing a much longer term affordable solution. Um, Second to that is the question of consumptive versus productive forms of energy, right? That it, it's great um, to be able to power a radio to read at night um, and sort of the assumption of the long-term impact of that. Um, but if it's not enough for you to be able to run a business, to be able to pump water, to be able to have productive sources of energy, are we actually, you know, going back to, are we providing the type of energy that helps get people out of poverty versus just having it be a little bit less miserable to be poor? Um, I'm, I'm going quickly given the five minutes, um, and I do want to acknowledge, I think it's all, it's all important, it's all good, it's all part of the spectrum, um, but really trying to, uh, in a universe of scarce capital, really think of how do we get to the solutions as quickly as possible. Um, and the third piece, to make sure I don't forget what it is, um, is also the question of ownership. So I think the other that we've been concerned by um, is that the majority of capital has been going to expats. Um, and has been coming from foreign capital, which means that people get access to energy on the continent, and that's amazing, um, but the profits that are made from that um, are fundamentally extractive, are, are leaving the continent. Um, and we've tried to prioritize companies um, that really are working on having some degree of local ownership or local entrepreneurship. Um, so some of the examples, and I should note we are invested in Gigawatt Global, um, the way that they've structured some of their deals, um, like their first utility scale project in Rwanda, of partnering with an orphanage um, and school um, to put the, um, the solar field on their land and essentially ensure um, that they're going to have operating budget for the next 10, 30, 20, 20 years. years. Um, so really thinking about how do we make sure that more of the proceeds from these projects actually go to community as opposed to just saying, and I think this is a problem across impact investing, not just in terms of renewable energy, of seeing beneficiaries just as the recipients and not as the protagonists. Um, and that we, if we really want to be in partnership, we need to shift that frame and really provide more opportunities for economic participation and ownership. Um, so I hate to do the classic mic drop, um, but I am going to have to uh, jump off um, and appreciate the opportunity to, to be here. I'm sorry to miss everyone's remarks. Thank, thank you, Morgan. And I think there's no question that, that I, I would imagine all of us would agree that the issue of whether it's local employment or training for the technicians, uh, as well as benefits to the, to the communities, the local communities, whatever the industry is, energy or, or otherwise, um, is a very important element of the whole issue of Africa in particular, let alone other emerging markets. So thank you. Thank you for that. Off you go. <laughs> Be care careful as you go down the stairs. I'm going to move over here next to you, Rick, if you don't mind. Um, so Rick, uh, we've talked about, um, well, tachlis is the word we use in Hebrew or Yiddish, which means uh, getting to it, getting to real action. Um, and so uh, Matt and, and Morgan kind of gave a, a, a more strategic uh, look into what it is we're talking about, about, about this kind of impact investing in renewables in, in, in Africa. And uh, Morgan actually challenged us with three good and important elements, but still kind of on the strategic level. I want to ask you to, to go a little bit more into the, 
into the specifics. So let me introduce Rick uh, Needham is the CEO or partner, I should say. I'll Sorry. Have to tell my yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to give you the promotion here, and we're announcing things in right. public. So this is really <laughs> from talk to action. Rick is a partner in the Rise Fund, uh, and he's the the fund sector lead in energy. Um, Rise is a fund, as uh, many of you know. Uh, um, part of or, or initiated by TRG, um, and it's a $2 billion fund. I've heard rumors, as maybe some uh, of the rest of you had uh, or read in the newspaper, of a new fund TRG is creating, Rise 2, or whatever it might be called, which may well be a $3 billion fund, so one of the major um, players in, in impact, especially on the, on the renewable side. But, uh, Rick has a very rich background in energy and sustainability. He was at Google responsible there for transformative large-scale renewable energy um, projects investing. He led that team. Uh, we're talking about uh, two and a half billion dollars of Google's investing in, uh, in renewables. Um, the most amazing part of Rick's background, which uh, uh, most people maybe don't know unless they, they look him up, is that he was an officer uh, in the US Navy uh, on a submarine. Um, and so I suppose you're used to maybe this kind of, it's not that we're claustrophobic here, but I was going to ask somebody who might know something about technology if we could turn the air conditioning uh, a little bit stronger here because it's a bit warm in this tent, in, in this room. Um, but Rick's background in aeronautics, astronautics from MIT, MBA from uh, Harvard Business School and uh, aerospace engineering, um, uh, bachelor's of science from the, the Naval Academy means that he knows a lot more about the engineering and science side of renewable energy production, but that informs his understanding of both how and best practices of investing um, in renewable energy projects, and particularly in Africa. So, Rick, please share with us some of your practical, tangible uh, recommendations or observations. John, I appreciate the, uh, the introduction and uh, appreciate being on the, the panel with, with everyone here. Uh, I, and I'll, I'll try to get practical. I, I think one of the things, uh, getting back to Matt was saying, was just the, the opportunity, right, is, is I guess when we look at renewables and the opportunity of renewables writ large, it, it's pretty dramatic based on the massive cost reductions that have happened over the last few years, something like 80% for solar and 67% for wind over the last eight years, uh, which is driving them to be the um, new energy source of choice because of economics, yeah. right, yeah. flat out. Um, and when you look at Africa in particular, with a, you know, probably the biggest solar potential in the world, something like 10 terawatts of potential, yep. it's 100 times the, the capacity that exists on the continent today, sub, sub-Saharan Africa. Yep. It's kind of shocking what the opportunity looks like. So why isn't more happening, right? Why, why aren't more projects being developed? Why aren't more um, solar installations being done? Um, and I, you know, I, I, you know, we talked about this a little bit. There, there are some, some challenges that we've seen. This is from my time at Google and investing in projects. We invested in two projects in Africa. Uh, and then looking at it now at the RISE Fund, where you know, we, we have lots of different sectors that we look at. But within the energy sector, one of the things that, we're, you know, the, the things that we tend to focus on are deep decarbonization and energy access. And deep decarbonization has many elements to it, efficiency, low carbon power, and electrification. So all these things can play out on the African continent. Um, I think the things that we've seen are, in many locations, it's this, this big question on how to pro when and how projects will actually get over uh, to the point of financial close and then execution. Um, there's, there's not, frankly, not a lot of risk in constructing a project and getting it onto the grid and running and delivering power. Like, it's pretty unlikely, you know, it's, it's pretty unlikely a solar plant just stops working. Um, what's the difficult thing is how do you make sure that it actually gets built? And you know this from having doing development uh, over many, many, many years, you know, to get to the point where you can actually get a, a project finance. So um, I'd point to a couple of examples of places that have done it well in, in time, you know, win windows of time. Um, South Africa, you know, if you remember, they, they had their kind of renewable energy um, basically program. It's got a bunch of letters in it. Um, but that allowed them to massively deploy uh, renewables to the order of gigawatts uh, in a clear, transparent way uh, with this reverse auction mechanism. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and that works out that worked out really well up until 2016 when suddenly they got to a point where they kind of filled it up and they said, okay, now what do we do to the policymakers? And then suddenly policymakers were kind of like deer in headlights. Um, so I think having a clear, transparent kind of um, ecosystem in which you can deploy projects is incredibly helpful. I mean, not in Africa, but in Latin America, same kind of thing happened in Argentina where I've talked to the energy minister there. He worked with the World Bank to establish mechanisms by which uh, you can basically get greater support uh, for the power purchase agreements, which it made everything a lot clearer. Right. So then projects flow. Smoother, right. Sm smoother, um, which then allows debt to flow into those projects. Right, more well. attractive. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's kind of the larger scale stuff. There's also the, you know, the smaller scale distributed um, power uh, as well. And that, that's whether it's solar home systems, it's microgrids, uh, it's, you know, grid extension actually as well. Mm. Um, and you know, for, as a fund, we've actually invested in a company that does commercial industrial rooftop uh, installations in India. Um, and one of the reasons that we found India attractive is the, this gets to another one of the challenges, is the economics of the power that's being delivered to commercial industrial customers versus the cost of deploying solar on their rooftops. Is, is there's, a, there's a big enough gap there um, where you can make an investment as an equity investor uh, and deploy those projects and earn a, a healthy profit. return, see a profit. Um, in some countries within Africa, in some cases, the power is subsidized, so the, the actual price of power can be lower, uh, so it becomes difficult to actually deploy those projects even though they, they would typically tend to make sense. Um, or other ones that don't have that put in policies around what the feed-in tariff might be that might not be attractive enough to bring in the equity investors. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I, I, I'm not sure how practical some of these things are, but in, there are many people who work in the social capital space who are thinking about how do we actually establish the ecosystems, the um, you know, the conditions on the ground such that investors can come in, uh, get much greater visibility into those those investments, because you know the, the, the project investments and the um, renewable energy projects, uh, they're not. <laughs> so we talked about this, they're not. They're not like VC investments. Like you don't have market risk, product risk. You know, team. Like you know, if you build it, it's going to deliver power. You've got it. So right, right. establishing the mechanisms that just enable those projects to get to the point where they can get built is uh, would probably be the biggest enabler uh, to help deploy more more uh, renewables. In Actually, going from that, I want to turn to Lisa to talk a little bit about both where we've been and where we're going, because a lot of the work that you're doing at Shine has uh, basically has helped to create that, that ecosystem. Um, and I have to say, it was not purposeful, but we're moving from rise to shine. <laughs> and, that, that's, and, and I was thinking about that the entire time we were preparing this, and it's not in the order that, that, that I had here. But I had to say it. I'm sorry. I hadn't even thought about that. So, rise and shine. Lisa <laughs> Jordan uh, is a senior philanthropic uh, executive with a 20-year career focused on impact and systemic change. Um, you currently serve as the campaign director for Shine, which is a global campaign to mobilize finance to end energy poverty. It's very much focused on what we're talking about today. Lisa previously served as the CEO of the Bernard Van Leer uh, Foundation and in leadership positions at the Ford Foundation, also at the Porticus Foundation. We led many, many nonprofits organizations. I'm not going through the whole list in Europe as well as the United States. Um, she has a master's degree in development studies from the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, Netherlands. Um, and thank you for joining us. I want to take us from what, uh, exactly from what Rick was talking about in terms of the mechanisms that have been put in place, are in place. Maybe you can give us a little bit of the, both the history and a little bit of a direction of, of where we're going, again, on the, the practical, tangible side, since you're, you're active in it, you know, on the ground. Thanks a lot, uh, Arya. That's very funny, rise and shine. <laughs> nice to, nice I can't to believe that's the first time that you thought of that. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, that is... So I want to say a few words first about Shine, because it's a really new campaign. It's a new mechanism. It launched in May. It brings together a set of unusual suspects. It brings together faith organizations. It brings together finance organizations. And it brings together foundations. And these are three organizations that have a very big role to play in ending energy poverty and are not normally speaking to one another and are not aligned across the way in which to tackle ending energy poverty. And we don't talk about the full renewable energy markets. We talk about... Um, 
the last mile of development. That's really where uh, Shine is focused. So we launched in May. We launched with $100 million uh, in commitments coming from these three sectors and really deploying th those commitments to access to energy champions, of which I see many uh, sitting in the room in front of us. So those are people who are really looking at last mile distribution um, mechanisms. So, and Sub-Saharan Africa is a place um, uh, which you saw in the description of this panel, where 600 million people are living without reliable, secure, or safe energy sources today. And if we're going to go through this renewable energy revolution, we should be bringing all 600 million of those people with us as we, as we go through the energy revolution. So um, one of the things that we thought was really important to do was to start mapping where is the money actually going and um, who is it coming from, and where is it headed. And so we have been, uh, in our first few months uh, together, working together, linking and learning from one another, mapping where are the foundations putting their grant money, what's happening with that. And we can see that the foundations from 2015 to today are doubling the amount of money that they're putting into this field, which is a fantastic thing because uh, we also know that we're not going to actually reach SDG 7 unless everybody gets engaged in one fashion or another. And so they started with about 50 million in the field, and they've gone to somewhere around 165 million uh, from 2015 to today. And a lot of that money is going to India uh, for many of the reasons that were already articulated. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the other half of the money, or it's, it's roughly uh, the other half of the money, is going into different uh, places in Africa. Kenya happens to be one of the places where there's critical mass on the African continent. And not all of that money is being deployed to build uh, renewable energy markets. Some of it is being deployed uh, for people who are in refugee camps, and it's coming through a charitable lens. Uh, some of it's being deployed around research and advocacy to try and get the policy frameworks right, which is what you can do with grant money that you can't necessarily do with investment money, and then a portion of it is being used for um, direct products and service delivery, and then another portion of it is being used to get the financing mechanisms right. So, so this is the first thing that China is trying to do, is really map out where uh, is this money going. We've done the same thing on the investment side from the private sector, so we're not really looking at the government money, but we're looking at the private sector money, and we can see that in the last uh, three years, from uh, 2015 uh, to today, there's been about 100 million a year deployed uh, from uh, private funds. We did a survey of 10 private funds, and we're excited to be able to say that there's a lot more money coming. So these big announcements, 2 billion, 1 billion, uh, so on and so forth, a lot of new funds are coming online, very exciting uh, new funds are coming online, and the 10 that we were able to survey, it looks like they're going to try and deploy um, or raise 1.5 billion, and they've already raised about 630 million from those 10 funds, including our friends from Acumen who are sitting, uh, Joe is sitting here. So um, it means that there's a lot more money that's going to be available uh, for mini grid, uh, for solar, solar is very popular, biomass is less popular, wind power is less popular, but they're coming along. Uh, so we can see that um, uh, it's a six times, uh, a, six, a six fold increase if that 1.5 billion actually does get deployed over the next two years into the field. And really remember that we're only really looking at that sort of um, access to energy or that energy poverty piece. Mm. The issue for those funds to actually be able to fulfill the promise that, that they uh, articulate is they're going to need, because we're talking about last mile distribution, they're going to need some concessional money that goes with them. And this is where the challenge is really arising, because foundations who can provide family offices and foundations who can provide that kind of concessional lending or that kind of um, grant funding that could help these funds actually really get to the last mile, don't see, they don't see eye to eye with the investors about how to, how to deploy their money. And that becomes uh, some of, somewhat of an issue. So um, Shine's role is to try and facilitate a dialogue between different kinds of capital that's um, becoming available, and to also bring in a very strong community engagement 
uh, conversation, which I, I think Morgan started to touch upon, the productive use conversation, the, you know, how do we um, build out economic growth in very rural areas for folks. And we can do that with that faith footprint, um, both with faith investors, but also with church leaders being engaged in one fashion, or um, temple leaders, or mosque leaders, or so on and so forth, these kinds of leaders. So um, this, is, this is, I think, what Shine uh, can start to, to bring to the table. And I'll just leave it there and uh, pick up on some other things a little bit later. Uh, OK, hey, thank you. And in fact, that's, uh, it's a very nice segue talking about the question of uh, the different kinds of both focuses, foci, uh, and, and needs or demands or requirements of the grant making world, foundation world, and geo world versus the investment world. Um, Jim Pass from Guggenheim uh, Partners um, has actually made a, uh, I would say, a life's work of understanding some of those issues in the energy sector in particular. Um, so, Jim, actually, I'd be happy if you would relate to the issue of how, how do we balance and how do we bring together the, the investment aspect and then the impact, uh, sustainability, how do we measure, how do we, how do we value, and therefore how do we sell or, or, or pitch sure. the kind of investments we're talking about. Jim Pass is the Senior Managing Director for Global Infrastructure at Guggenheim Partners, the project finance sector manager and a portfolio manager there as well. He's responsible for research, development, implementation of investment strategies um, for the firm's efforts in the infrastructure arena. Um, you have a lot of background and, and experience in financing, advising, and operating uh, infrastructure assets, uh, airports, power plants. I know we were talking earlier about healthcare facilities, et cetera, student housing complexes. Um, I know you've spoken at the World Economic Forum, the White House Business Council, uh, and many other different uh, forums. Um, with your focus on energy, I think that uh, you also have a, a BA in diplomatic history and political science from the University of Pennsylvania, and you spent the last two decades focused specifically on these issues. Um, I'd be happy if you'd share with us not only your, your comments and observations about the general topics, but also I want you to mention um, the, the study that you just uh, came out with, which obviously I think is one of the biggest things we're talking about that answers some of these demands or needs that, uh, that Lisa, you were, you were referring to. Great, well, um, yeah. thank you very much, and um, thanks for hanging out with us until um, hmm. five o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I think it's important to understand that infrastructure or renewable energy projects in Africa is a relatively new investment vehicle. Um, we all use infrastructure on a day-to-day -day basis, but not too many of us consider owning an airport or buying a road or owning an energy facility. And I think a lot of institutional investors like myself um, are still coming to grips on how do we analyze an infrastructure project, whether it's in Africa, in Asia, or the United States for that matter. And at one point, value, sustainability will all converge. And at this conference, obviously, sustainability is very, very critical. And when we analyze an infrastructure asset, um, whether it's a project in Africa or Asia or the United States, wherever it may be, it first has to have financial attractiveness. It has to produce a return. And that return will vary based upon a risk profile of the investor or of the project in itself. But what we've begun to see and what we're trying to incorporate in our investment process is trying to understand what is the natural capital aspect of that. Because there's human capital, there's financial capital, but also there's resources that are in the ground um, or basically in the benefit of where the location may be, where the energy facility could be in Africa. And that natural capital is something that up until now has not really been evaluated um, extremely well. And so when we look at a project in Africa, for example, we want to make sure that not only is the project transformational, like what Shine was, um, kind of like what your focus will be in making sure that is the last mile, and what Morgan was saying, we also want to take into consideration how do we preserve and protect the environment? How do we preserve that natural capital that is extremely important to really the sustained goals of the UN, the really the 17? And when you put all this together, you still have to have that aspect of a financial return. 
And so what we're, we've been doing at Guggenheim is we established a protocol, um, not targeted in, in Africa at the moment, but it's for the Arctic. And because it's another area where energy, um, resource-driven energy, whether it's wind, solar, hydro, um, can basically develop on a very, very attractive basis. And the big difference between the Arctic and Africa, or one of the big differences, is really just the vastness. And what we've tried to do is make sure that all the stakeholders in our protocol, which is now um, under the domain of the Arctic Economic Council, is focusing on the indigenous people. We want to make sure that they have a seat at the table when we're looking at that. And what the paper that um, Eric brought about was really the culmination or the next step from the Arctic Protocol to bringing that protocol into more of an institutional um, acceptance level of projects on a global basis. Because one of the aspects of my client base that's focused on is how do we measure sustainability? If I'm going to make an equity commitment in a project in Africa, how do I know that's actually going to transform um, the life of someone or to improve poverty and so forth? So we like to have some type of metrics on how we can analyze the effectiveness of our dollars. Not so much the financial return, but how do we make sure that the money is actually um, doing good, lack of a better word. And we're not impact investing. This is institutional money that needs a return, but we're layering in another aspect of this. And so this paper that was announced about two weeks ago at a um, IMF meeting focuses on how can the institutional investor analyze the different standards that measure sustainability? How do we measure the UN SDGs? And in light of my opening comments that infrastructure is still an evolving assets, these metrics are still evolving as well. So even though there's been a lot of progress in Africa and other aspects, once the tools for the institutional investor are there to really demonstrate and identify the effectiveness, not just the financial return aspect of it, but also the other intangibles, it'll be a pretty effective um, tool. I think also, if I understood right, Jim, uh, Guggenheim is going to make this tool available um, not only for the use of your uh, clients, uh, investors, and what have you, but also for the wider community. Am I right? So our, our goal following the study is to actually analyze four projects. Um, both are brownfield and greenfield. They may be energy. They may be transportation. And analyze these metrics and see how they perform in different developments. And then based upon those conclusions, then that instrument um, will be available not just you know, for investors. Right. Okay, well, that's terrific and also very practical. Right. And the truth is, Joe, you have a master's in sustainability from Cambridge. If we're talking about here about uh, sustainability standards, I'm assuming that you guys can have a conversation afterwards. And okay. Joe, you can evaluate how, how good the indice and the, and the, the mechanisms that, that, uh, that Jim's talking about are. are. Um, so lastly, let me turn to you. Joe Opat is the uh, senior managing, sorry, the <laughs> sorry, head of I'll business development. I'll be senior managing, too. <laughs> this is a great day for both CEO. of us. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, head of I, should, I, I should have promoted you to CDO <laughs> like I did, Rick. Apologies. Um, Joe's uh, the head of business development on the West Coast for Acumen, um, where you're leading partner engagement, post-investment support, and fundraising uh, strategy. Um, Acumen, by the way, has invested in some 113 companies, I think, across uh, 13 different countries. Um, before coming to Acumen, Joe developed uh, tech platforms for early stage ventures at the, as the director of business development uh, at the Single Brook Technology Company. You started your career in the United Nations at, uh, in Kenya, Russia, the United States. Uh, like Morgan and Jim and I guess the rest of us, you're on the plane half the time. And thank you very much for joining us today, given that you did have a an airport-related incident that uh, brings you a little bit in uh, uh, a bit more difficult circumstances than we anticipated. But thank you okay. for making the effort. Joe holds a BA in political science uh, and French from Middlebury, as well as the Master's in Sustainability that I mentioned from University of Cambridge. Um, focusing on tangible issues, innovative okay. finance uh, and sustainability. Happy if you'll share your thoughts with us. Um, hi, everyone. I know it's... Mid-afternoon, I can see some people nodding. We're going to make this fun. <laughs> and fun. We yeah. have a party right after this, so, yeah. so we're leading up to that. So, um, Acumen, we have 
um, as is mentioned, invested around 115 million of philanthropy-backed um, dollars. And yet we operate as a VC, so we either invest debt or equity. Our model is focused on identifying companies that are um, early stage in the pioneer gap um, and investing over a six to 12 year period using a patient capital model. Specific to energy, our first investment was in 2007 with a company called Delight that was working on a solar lantern and has since moved to solar home systems. Our main focus has been um, thinking of renewable off-grid solutions. Um, and one of the things that we thought about this year is, given that we've been doing this for 10 years, how do we really understand how the market has moved? And I like that Lisa began talking about the different players from a funding perspective. Um, we were looking at it both from how much money is going to early stage ventures in the renewable energy space. Now, uh, one of the things we found, great news, is that between 2012 and 2017, in 2012, um, most entrepreneurs raised around 50 million. In 2017, that went out to 300 million, which was great. So there's increased money flowing to this particular area. Now, what was tricky about that data set is that if you think of the Energy Access for All, Sustainable Development Goal 7, um, we fall pretty short of what we need. When we think about what's annually going into the space, you have around 11.6 million. But if we're really to hit the goal of working towards energy access, we actually need around 216 million um, per year, just for this specific equity energy access. This is not thinking of whether it's grid extension as a solution or the other types of capital, whether it's debt. There's a lot to be done. Mm. Furthermore, as we dove into this into more detail, trying to understand, so fine, it's not, we have this 300 million, how is it being dispersed? One of the things that came up for us was 67% of all the money that's going into um, these ventures is going to four companies. Mm. 67%. Not errors. Yeah. I can tell that you that. <laughs> <laughs> pause. Um, and and that, that gives us a moment for pause. It seems like, as investors, we're all crowding the same deals. Mm. And that was one side of it. So what can we do to change that? And, um, and to Morgan's point of how many of these companies have been run by in-country or local entrepreneurs, as opposed to that dynamic where you have um, expatriates, or can we even have situations where you have an expat local blend to make it work, as you're discussing? Mm. So that was one element of how do we identify that challenge and what do we want to do about it. The second is we then began to interview our investees. Uh, we have, and we spoke to 15 of our energy um, access investees, and we're specifically asking them, so one part is as investors we need to change our approach. The second part of this is as an entrepreneur, what do you wish you changed when you're at the negotiating table? What do you wish you changed, did differently in your term sheet? And we released a report that both dives into this data around how much money is flowing in the sector, plus true stories from our entrepreneurs about the time an entrepreneur accepted debt when they really should have gone for equity and what was the role of grants. And if they're to restructure their table, what would they, go to ta what would they ask for? Now, and if we had those kind of like tangible examples of how do you rethink the type of capital company needs as they grow, the third part of this is exits that we're also curious about. So Acumen, yes, we have patient capital six to 12 years, but we need exits to prove this. We need it for rise, we need, um, and Trillium, you're all wondering, is this all funny money that's going out, but what is the business model? Now, there's, it's hard to really understand what's going on in the exit world, and so our next report um, that we're going to work on is going to focus on can we all begin to share what we're seeing about exits? Can we also take a step back and as we begin to think of the time sheet and enter into these deals, can we structure the exit pathway? And then also, what is the possibility of a secondary market? The idea that for Acumen, a good number of our deals, so with Delight we've invested five million over the time period we've been with them, um, but when we have new investors coming in, they're adding in more money, but not necessarily buying out existing investors. What does it take to create a secondary market to make that mm. possible? Mm. 
Now, I think in terms of tangible next steps, um, one key one that's for me is this question of how do we look at local entrepreneurs, in-country entrepreneurs, and what's the blend is important. So next year, I am moving to Kenya, to East Africa, and, and really trying to understand how do we fit that into Acumen's ledger model and mm. have a specific focus. Yep. Th that's terrific and a great starting point to move to the more practical. Um, well, we've been very practical in the discussion until now. In a minute, I will turn to those of you, I know that we have both investors and some NGOs. I, I saw one or two uh, banks and also entrepreneurs and companies. So if you have questions for any of us up here or general questions, um, I'm going to turn to you shortly. So prepare yourselves, as it were. But first, I'm going to come back to, to you guys to talk. I, I want to say if there's a company or a, or a bank or an investment fund that's sitting here or, or watching online and... Uh, looking for, okay, what do you need? What do you need as an investment fund? What do you need as, uh, as uh, a, a company to answer, to practically move one step forward? So for instance, what you just said, Joe, which I really believe in, is uh, I think that you're more likely to get funded by a, an investment company, firm, VC, bank, what have you, if you come with a local team or with at least a partnership with a local team because it shows you know what you're doing on the ground. Um, I think that's very true. I know that there's uh, an impact investment fund that we're in touch with, uh, that we've had extensive discussions with. They brought, they have uh, offices in Kenya and Tanzania, even though it's a Dutch fund, and they brought their entire team to our field in Rwanda to look and learn on the ground kind of what are the kind of things that they're getting involved in. I think from, from our experience, I would say that is a practical application to any company that's saying, I want to do renewable energy rooftop or grid scale or anything in between in Africa. The first question is, okay, who do you have on the ground? What do you know about the business uh, on the ground? So that's a good practical place to, to, to begin. I'm asking you guys, uh, in whatever order you'd like, what else can you, can you offer as a practical tool to the people sitting here or, or watching that can help to accelerate the kind of investment that we're talking about, the kind of projects that we're talking about. So perhaps um, I'll say something about the missing middle uh, and the ticket size, because that's a big issue. We see that there's not enough uh, investment going into uh, those who are able to make deals underneath the $2 million mark, and that is a really big need. I think we have... 85 small and medium business enterprises in our database now that are all working on ending energy poverty, all working to some degree into that last mile. And they, they are looking for deals that are, that they're looking for investors who can really operate in that missing middle space. So when we talk to new investors coming into this field and we've, um, th that's what we've been doing for the last eight weeks is talking to a whole bunch of new investors to ask them, you know, could you get involved and what would you need to get involved and so on and so forth. We're really stressing with them whether they could come in uh, into the space uh, in, with smaller deals. So the $2 billion and the $1 billion and the so on and so forth are very exciting, but that means that you don't, you know, how many people do you have on your team that's going to allow you to make deals where you can actually deploy that capital? Mm. So that capital mm. has to be democratized, democratized and disaggregated to, to a um, much greater degree. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. Um, anybody else? Or I'm going to call on you. If I mean, you I guess the one thing I, I would add is really having the role of a strategic partner, mm. um, especially with a lot of um, the institutional money that Guggenheim has. It's much more, um, I mean, we're looking for partners to help us understand and how to deploy capital in Africa. And so I think that would be an aspect that if you're coming to, um, you know, our offices, bringing a strategic partner would be extremely um, helpful in that project. Okay, that's a very, very good point, especially when you're talking about America, where the appetite for investing in Africa is not as strong as in Europe. There's a there's a, a greater distance and unfamiliarity. So coming in with a, uh, a company where, or a fund, or a bank, whatever, that knows Africa and knows renewable energy is going to make uh, a more comfortable conversation. Correct. I hear that. Rick. I think um, there's, a, I guess, a, a few things. One is certainly the, the local presence on the ground. Mm. This is the market you're building your business in. You know the, 
the local yeah. market. And ideally, you have people who comprise the company from that market. Um, we also, you know, look to see. This is one of the challenges we've seen in the um, the off-grid solar space. Is you know, for better or worse, we tend to focus on we're, we're doing larger check sizes. Like our minimum check size for us would be like 30 million. So we're just not appropriate for some of the younger companies. But uh, there are companies that are looking for those check sizes. But I mean, just I'll be honest. Like the economics of the of the, of the business don't support um, the valuations and, and the usage of those funds. Mm. So we are looking for businesses that are on a pathway to profitability, if not already profitable. And I know, you know, people will say, well, that's hard. Um, yeah, but that's where that's where the big dollars will come. Mm -hmm. um, and and there has been a bit of a a, a run towards. <clears throat> Uh, this again is more the off-grid space. A, a run towards let's get a lot of uh, a lot of units out there, a lot of people, um, users, uh, and growth for growth sake, without necessarily fine-tuning that business model piece to ensure you're delivering something that's of value at the right price, so you're actually able to to make the economics of the business work well. Um, there's there's challenges I know in you know raising the financing and distribution and you know monitoring and, and um, servicing those those systems, but um, I mean, that's just, that's what we would be looking for. We, we haven't seen it yet in a, in, a, in a company that has the ability to then scale it up. Um, but that's just one of the things that we would certainly be looking for. All right. We will talk later yeah, yeah. about Giga <laughs> Global scaling yeah. up and, and our pipeline. Yeah. Um, but we've been focusing on companies. What kind of advice can we give to funders? What, can we, what, what kind of input can we give to an investment bank or, or an investment fund in terms of their decision-making processes that would also help to accelerate and to, and to streamline the, the process. Matt, putting you on the spot. So, or Joe, because you're smiling. Either of you, whoever wants to go first. I'll let Joe go. <laughs> let you go first. <laughs> you first. I can give you another minute to think, because I have an idea. Now, you go ahead. Um, so advice to, to investors, funders, um, about the space. Um, I, would, I would say I think there's uh, generally um, a fear based on geography. There's a fear um, based on lack of local knowledge. So therefore, again, the partnerships and having people on the ground is important. Um, and, you know, but I, I'll just say back to sort of an earlier question, which was uh, the, the missing middle. Oftentimes, what's missing also is there's when you're talking to the earlier stage entrepreneurs, they're not sure what they're looking for mm. in terms of capital, um, whether they want <laughs> debt or equity, whether they're, how you know, much, and, and how, how much and how to structure it. And so you've got to bring to any uh, earlier stage opportunity sort of knowledge mm -hmm. and an ability to structure and work with the entrepreneur, which is, is very different than when you're trying to do a $30 million investment. So. Right. Very different, very different, um, you know, exercise. Yeah, no, yeah. Okay, I think that's helpful. I'll yeah. actually build on that. Um, we are actively seeking to for better ways for investors to talk about deals they're interested in making. Can we sit around the table and understand that your grant money is going to flood the company at the wrong time? My equity should go to this goal, right. and they need debt. But if we don't work out their equity to debt ratio, we're screwing <coughs> them all together. Mm. Those conversations don't happen as much as they need to. Mm. That's one for investors. How do we work through that? The second is on impact measurement. Ooh, the fun one. Um, around four years ago, uh, we internally felt quite frustrated that sending our investees these reports or working through existing systems for um, one time intensive uh, and totally felt like investor or funder, tell me what I want to, to know in the same way of doing your tax returns versus being insightful R&D that the company wanted to all to do. Mm. So we introduced a method called lean data and the idea is to leverage mobile um, and in a six to eight week period get feedback directly from the end user, the consumer about their solar lantern, about their clean cook stove, about their, the mini grid system they're on. Um, and the good thing about that is that you can break it down to gender. If someone says, I can, I'm using this for productive use and it's running the fridge and the lights in my store, you ask, what are you doing with the free time? What is your earnings? Is this helping you move up, move up the energy ladder? And just continue with this mobile back and forth and build a database that then not only allows you to truly see this company from the perspective of the end user, but then we can then benchmark 
So we're doing this together with Gates, with the media, with Diffid, and 40 other um, investors mm. in the space. And our idea is to have a platform that anyone can access as an entrepreneur or as an investor or a consultant somewhere in the middle, a practitioner. Mm. And we can have a better idea of how does what you're doing in Kenya correspond to Haiti or how does this cook of company mm -hmm, compare to mm -hmm. the other and share best practices. Fantastic. That's really interesting mm -hmm. and that's new to me. Um, that, 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 that seems to me to be an incredibly important tool and which will augment, Jim, what you were talking about, about the sustainability uh, right. index in order to be able to evaluate from an investment perspective mm -hmm. um, what's actually being achieved. Let me turn to the, to the participants here with uh, questions. Yeah, please raise your hand. There's a microphone. We'll start with you in the back just because the microphone's there and then we'll come up to you. We're just waiting for the microphone to, to be turned on. Does that work? Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Mitra Arjun and I was the CEO and founder of Lumita Networks, which built the Paygo software that was operating many of the companies in 20 countries or so in Africa. And we exited 18 months ago to Mobisol. Um, which means I can say the things here that, I, that entrepreneurs who are looking for money can't say. Right? And in particular, echo the point made about the missing middle. There really is very little money. There's a lot of studying, a lot of talking, and very little action in that missing middle. And there's two big consequences of that. One consequence is that that money in the missing middle is ridiculously expensive. Mm -hmm. Not because yeah. of the percentage of it, but because of the time it takes you to get it. Mm. Yeah. And this is a sector which is growing so fast that we, when we sold, were doubling in size every three months. So you can imagine how expensive the money is when it takes six months to do the DD, yeah. which yes. is true for several of the, many of the impact investors at this conference. The second consequence is something that Joe mentioned about all the money going to a few players. <laughs> Well, what does that mean in practice? It means that those companies can afford to sell products that are more expensive and lower quality mm. than all their competitors. They essentially yes. drive the competition out of business mm. by using impact money to drive marketing to sell inferior, lower quality products. We sold, we sold technology to companies, for example, that were in Kenya with products that were much cheaper and much better than the products that were coming from MCOPA. But because MCOPA gets all the impact money, they still mm. dominate the market. And that's true across a lot of sectors, but I think impact investors really need to have more of the entrepreneurs in this conversation. And some of the distortions that we're seeing when you look at it from San Francisco might disappear. If I can just translate that into a, because I'm trying to be very practical and tangible, one of the things that you're saying is that the investment community should be reaching out to entrepreneurs even if they're not going to be funding them necessarily in, their co in, in terms of their own funding decisions, but to learn more about the particular market or the, partic or the country or whatever that they're thinking of investing in. I really agree with that. It's a very good point. Thank you. You had your hand up? We just need the microphone down here, please. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Jeff, the CEO of a company called Jazza that operates in Tanzania. And I kind of have a question for Billy on something Joe mentioned going to Rick, like the really early stage stuff and, you know, talking about valuations and like, you know, you sell half your company for a million bucks and hope to get to the 30 million check size. Like, you know, you guys see a lot of transactional data because you do deals and you're on that side of the table. And then on the other side of the table, like, we see one deal, which is our own. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the transparency of like how we build that roadmap, and you guys are talking like, well, how do we structure this? Like debt, equity, grants, at what phase? Like it's hard on our side to understand, are we making a mistake by even taking a grant? Yeah. And then, you know, Rick's not gonna fund it because he's like, that doesn't <laughs> work for us, right? So like on the other side of the table, Acumen, you do a great job of like publishing and writing and getting the information out there, but in terms of the transactional roadmap, what can we do on our side to learn more about all the information, all the deals you see so we can structure the companies right to continue that roadmap? Thank you. Excellent Thank you. Um, you're spot on, and every one of our energy investees that we spoke to mentioned that, mm -hmm. that, that th this is something that as a sector we should consider. Um, 
which is part of why we included their feedback in the report. The report is called Accelerating Energy Access, the Role of Patient Capital. It's on our website. Um, and it dove into, I should not have, it's bit the CEO of X company breaking down. I received money this time, I should not have. What we're trying to see is in country, can we also have moments where we bring those CEOs together and have a round table where they can share best practices? And we've done that, I think, twice, not as often. We need to do it more. And, and even had heated conversations around, should you ever accept grants? And what does that do for you? And which types of grants? So yes, um, I think the tricky part to how do you get plugged into those networks, and it's as, as you're really starting, is another that we need to build in terms of a local ecosystem. We're trying to work on it, we've not figured it out, but I'd love to give you my contact so you can connect with the other CEOs. Yeah. So can I say something about that as well? I wouldn't overestimate the amount of knowledge that investors have because it's not a lot. There is no <laughs> aggregated, I mean, really, sorry. Yes, no, you're right. I just wouldn't overestimate that amount of knowledge because in other fields that are nascent, and this is a, especially the piece of this field that I'm working on, the access to energy piece of the field, in, in other fields that are nascent that have just a few um, investors or a few foundations engaged in, there are aggregators who are um, bringing some transparency to those fields. I'm thinking about people who are working in the agriculture field with um, small farmers, for example. There are aggregators that bring data together so that investors can learn from one another. We don't have that in this field. And I would really like to see Shine start to begin to experiment b both with um, looking at deal flow and who's tracking deal flow and bring some transparency to that, but also to figure out a way in which to get people to link and learn as they're um, both looking at what happens with grants and looking at what happens with, uh, with, with these new funds that are coming online. Uh, so I just, it, it, point absolutely taken, investees don't have access to that information, but I really don't think the investors have access to that information either. I guess I, I would, um, it's not like, I, at least from our perspective, we don't have some magic structure that a company has to have. I, I'll make it really simple. Uh, make it, have a company that's delivering a product or service to a customer that's willing to pay more for it than it costs you to make. <laughs> and that, like, there it is, right? Um, but I, that's obviously, you know, a little tongue in cheek, but, um, you know, obviously it takes, you know, capital and time to build a business, to build a product and, and do those things. Um, there are, it's a, sometimes frustrating when I've looked at the space too, there's no, um, there's a little bit of a, I don't know that the, it's kind of come together, maybe as the ag group has, it feels like there's more kind of competition between companies versus yeah. co Um mm -hmm. And even just definitional things like what, you know, what's the quality of your receivables? Like not only are you gonna get a different answer, you have different definitions of right. that answer. And so how does an investor like even compare those? Like it takes like several conversations digging into that. Like, well, what exactly are you measuring? I just wanna understand how much, you're, whether you're getting paid for that product. Um, so it, it becomes difficult to, um, so as much as you can be kind of transparent in the definitions that you use, uh, that's gonna just help whatever investor you go to. Mm. You know, what's your name? Yeah, uh, Jeff, your question reminded me of something I learned this morning that I hadn't. My, my background, I, I've lived in Israel for the last 35 years, and my background in business has been more in the startup, high-tech sector in Israel, as many of you know. There are more startups in Israel than, than anywhere else in the world outside of America. Um, and it's always fascinated me how the investment community looks at potential high-tech or biotech or health tech, but mainly software or, or, or networking startups in Israel, which is basically, oh, this is an interesting idea. And it seems that there might be a market. And so we'll value the company at X. And we're hoping to get, you know, 10X out of our investment. What I learned this morning, after 30 years in following and being actively involved in these kind of uh, deals in the high tech sector, is that the average return for most VC funds, including start, including seed uh, venture funds, the average return is not this mythical 10X that people always talk about. That's what they want to get. They normally get one out of 10, if they're lucky, mm. 10X. And they'll get one out of 10, maybe 5X, and then they'll get maybe two that are, or three that are 1X, meaning they get their money back, which is hardly considered a success. The point of this morning, and this is by Looney Liebes, I think is the way you pronounce his name, that I found fascinating is that when you calculate what the real return is, there's about a 2.3X return for most VC funds over the last 20 or 30 years, even in the high-tech startup uh, sector, what have you. What that means to, I think, to you, Jeff, as a, as a company or to all of us, and I'm actually 
taking this conversation and turning it as I, as I really want to do to the investment community, is that we have a bit of a mismatch here. Mm -hmm. This is my two cents, if you will, and then I, there's a question over here. The mismatch is when an investment company or an investor looks into the high-tech sector, they have no idea what the potential returns are. They have no idea what the product is going to sell, what the revenue is going to look like. They can look at some chart of, well, the market is, you know, 300 million strong, and if we get 10% of that market, we're going to have 30 million customers. Uh, you know, good luck with that. Some, some work, and most don't. But they value the company, and then they put the money in based on this kind of feeling like there could be success. Whereas what you were saying, Rick, and this is what I'm relating to, Jeff, your question, is that here in the energy sector, you're talking about assets which exist, companies with track records, PPAs, power purchase agreements, which are bankable assets because they're assured streams of, of revenue, the investment community, and to a certain extent, I'm challenging those of you in the investment community who are, who are with us today or watching, the investment community should take a leaf out of the, out of the high tech sector and give up at least a little bit of the rigidity that is traditional in the infrastructure world. We need to have this kind of return. We need to have this kind of a, of a structure. We need to have this percentage of equity versus debt or what have you. If you're going to throw $10 million or $20 million into a, into a startup venture, which has one in 10 if you're lucky, maybe one in 100 chance of succeeding, right? and your average return is going to be two or two and a half x, then take some of that risk or that some of that risk profile and, and apply it to renewables in Africa and say, okay, it has to meet certain standards that we're looking for, but I'm going to take a little bit more risk than I usually would in infrastructure, and not least because there are these risk mitigation uh, envelopes and mechanisms that are built into the industry, but I've talked enough. There was a question um, back here. Yes, Miss, uh, the, the young woman and then the gentleman in front of her. Hi, my name is Ugwe Maneo. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Solstice Energy Solutions. Yeah. We're an energy technology company that develops hardware and software to connect and intelligently manage distributed energy assets. Um, my question, uh, especially since we're talking about renewables and energy in Africa, we often immediately start talking about energy access and the millions of people who need connection. And while that's important, it often overshadows the millions of people in cities, uh, not only in Africa, mm -hmm that struggle with unreliable and bad grids. Yeah. Nearly 2% of Africa's GDP is lost because of unreliable electricity grids in these, city, in these urban areas. So what are we doing to not only talk about energy access, but talk about the increase in energy consumption, majority of which for the next 20 years in the world is coming from emerging markets. The current trajectory says it's going to be fossil fuels, and this is not off-grid. We have a chance to change that, but we have to think about those market segments as well. Mm, and the stability of them. Thank you. Well, uh, Rick? I'm glad you asked that question. I even had one of my notes. Um, Africa loses, I heard, I heard, 2 to 4% of GDP because of unreliable power. It has like nine of the 12 worst countries for reliability of power. Um, this is a really, it is a segment, I think, that hasn't garnered as much attention as it should. Uh, and frankly, from an investor perspective, it's really interesting because you have uh, small and medium businesses who rely on power for their business. They're not, it's not a customer that's deciding, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll pay for my home solar system so I can get a light or burn a kerosene lamp to do that. They're like, I need to run my business. I need the power. And so sometimes the alternative is either the business isn't working, or it's run a diesel gen set that's sitting in the back. And another interesting quote I heard, someone can check the veracity of this, but like Nigeria has a grid capacity of something like four gigawatts. They have a diesel capacity of something like 10 gigawatts. Yeah. I mean, that, it's like a, a grid that's been built out three times. Um, and why? Because it's just unreliable. So I, I think that's a really interesting opportunity. Um, and there should be more attention paid to it because it's actually, it's, it, you know, I, I think one of the reasons, just my guess is the, it's the, the, maybe the, the depth of impact on individual people from access is pretty clear, and everyone can see that. Um, the, the, the impact that comes from a more reliable power might uh, accrue more to businesses, and it just, it doesn't, you, know, you don't have a family that's no longer burning kerosene in their home, right? What you have is a business that's no longer burning diesel in their gen set, uh, it, so it's a little bit different, but I'm, I, I like that opportunity. I'd love to, we can chat more. Probably mm -hmm. a young company for, for us, but um, I know there's others that should be looking at it as mm -hmm. well. 
Thank you. A anybody else? Yeah, that'll also, that particular tier we talked um, last night, uh, that particular tier will be uh, highlighted in the energies, Energizing Finance Report, which is coming out on November 13th oh, great. by SE for All, because it is an opportunity for the 30 million. You know, it's an opportunity for the much bigger deals, uh, and it's an important area. You know, they tier across five tiers what kind of energy people have access to, mm. and you can make commercial deals with that yeah. uh, with that arena. I'm actually interested in what you said. I would be happy to speak with you afterwards, also, because we're we're involved uh, as a company in some of the most fragile states in Africa: Burundi, South Sudan, uh, Liberia, uh, and many others. And it sounds interesting to me, at least just the half a sentence that you gave in terms of the the software that you're providing. So, and thank you for the question. Right, the gentleman here. Oh, Sorry, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, great point. Um, growing up in Kenya, definitely have family and friends who are living through that. Yeah. Um, just unreliability of the grid. There is, as we look at it, Acumen, there's another unique level that comes to dealing with that particular problem, which goes into public policy, um, where you're then more directly engaging the government with existing infrastructure, and in a number of countries, the government has a very strong hold on that. Um, and what do you need to build as an investor to not only think about the dollars you're pushing out, but also have a public policy arm? And that has been really tricky to wrap our heads around, um, but we're trying to figure it out. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Um, the gentleman here, and then I guess we'll take one last question. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Bowie. I work for a consultancy called TMP Systems. Uh, we work with uh, large investors on renewable energy projects, amongst others across Africa and Southeast Asia. And one issue that we've come into very consistently um, with kind of, I'd say, medium rather than large scale energy projects is getting local buy in. I think there's an assumption, you know, that oh, it's a renewable energy project, therefore it's going to be green, it's going to be nice, and the people are going to want it. But you know, the most notorious example is probably in Kenya at the moment, but uh, Lake Takana, for example, King Am King Ampop, there are plenty. There are plenty of these examples. And it's fundamentally the same issue that you see in any large land-based investment, agriculture, forestry. So I was just, I, I know that Jim touched on that kind of briefly when he mentioned engaging indigenous peoples in, in the Arctic. I was just wondering if how that kind of jived with your experience and whether you did see that as a significant barrier to getting to scale. Hmm. Anybody? <laughs> well, I'll just say one of the reasons why Shine has um, worked very hard to bring the faith community into this conversation is because the faith community has a footprint all over Africa, and in fact, all over many places around the world, that is really deeply engaged in community and can build the community demand. And I think Morgan talked about this um, in her remarks before she left, which was a, an important point around what is the energy going to be used for? I mean, we talk about energy in the apps, we talk about energy uh, on its own, but in fact, energy is a utility, and a utility is used for all sorts of other aspects of your life. And building that demand, organizing around that demand is one of the things that foundations do with their grant monies. It's also one of the things that church, uh, churches and church institutions can do is to try and organize the community around, okay, what do you want um, energy for and, and how can it make your life uh, uh, um, better in some aspects or another. There is a really fantastic community-owned a utility in Tanzania that came about because of 20 years of community building by the Catholic, uh, by a, a number of Catholic charities and then EU financing that came in. And it's a really wonderful model uh, where now that community owns the electricity, they own the utility, they're actually um, having checks written by the government coming into the community as a result of the work that the, really the sort of ground uh, community demand work that was done uh, through a faith-based institution. So it's a good point, and we also have examples where things have really failed because the community was not brought in uh, um, where that, converse, that conversation didn't take place, and, and they just they simply can't afford it, or they don't know what to do with it, or it's, it's not useful to their daily lives. And they don't feel that they're, that they're paid for it. Yeah. Um, I'll just add one, one comment from our experience at Gigawatt. 
Um, Morgan mentioned that uh, an orphanage in Rwanda uh, is the landowner where our field is, but more than that, in all the projects that we build, we try and involve the local community by providing employment, which uh, obviously creates a, a stakeholder um, effect, uh, or providing medical uh, treatment or, or medical clinics uh, for the local communities. In Burundi, for instance, we're building our first off-grid, uh, mini-grid uh, facility because the small community uh, that's actually next to the land where we're building our commercial scale field is not connected to the grid. They're going to be living next to this commercial uh, field and not have the electricity or the benefits from it. We're also providing them uh, employment. And I want to also mention um, what you said, Lisa, about the, the faith community. First of all, the, the Vatican and the Anglican Church um, together are basically the largest landholders on the continent uh, of Africa, landowners. Um, and they don't do a lot with the land that they own. We're in extensive discussions with both uh, of the, the Anglican and the Vatican Church um, through an NGO that we're partnered with called the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development. Um, and they have a project called FIRE, um, Faith Inspired Renewable Energy. And one of the elements of the program that we're pursuing together is to build um, off-grid, mini-grid uh, installations on church land where you get this combination where the church benefits from, even if it's uh, subsidized uh, uh, lease terms, from some income for their own educational or, or welfare purposes. The community uh, sees this project as something that's affiliated with their faith community, with the church, and therefore there'll be less vandalism and more interest in supporting it or what have you. So you're 100% right that the, that the issue of and what you're talking about, the challenge of of bringing the community together to support the enterprise because they will benefit from it and not see it as some outside, you know, uh, uh, foreign company coming in just to, to make a living uh, or to make a profit or what have you. It's a very, very important um, issue. So we only have like five minutes left. So one, one last question here and then I'll ask each of you to, to so give my, 30 seconds of a, of a response or a, or a wrap up. Yes. My name is Emilian. Um, I'm a partner in a, in a fund which focuses on Africa, digital growth. We invested in off-grid electric in Tanzania, amongst other uh, companies. So I particularly know the pace you go solar industry, and I've looked at every single player in the industry. Um, my, my question is around, I mean, we all know that the industry needs way more money than we thought a couple of years ago, right? I was reading a really interesting report published by the Shell Foundation a couple of days ago, $2 billion, $2 billion total investment needed in the industry, right? But I've seen a lot of new players, and I think, I think uh, some of the CEOs of those companies are here. The second level, I would say, pay go solar companies. Everyone comes to me and asks me, who are the people to whom we should know, we should go and ask them for money, right? Because we see that uh, the typical commercial VCs, I mean, the, the industry was super, super hot a couple of days ago, and you know, uh, it's, it's much more difficult to raise money today than it was in 2016, 2015, even 2017, right? So mm. the question is, who are the names if, if one of those second level pay to go solar companies would come to you guys, who are the few names or who are the, the type of VC, the type of, of capital you would you'd advise those guys to tap into? Thank you for the question. Um, Lisa, I'm turning to you because I seem to remember, correct me if I'm wrong, that you actually have a list of leading uh, investors uh, and investment funds in this, uh, <laughs> in this realm. Yeah, there's uh, a... I mean, we surveyed 10 funds to figure out um, what their ticket sizes are, what they're investing in, where they're going with their capital, how much they've deployed, how much they hope to deploy, how much they hope to raise, et cetera. So some of those players will be known to you. It's Triodos, it's Responsibility, it's Bamboo, it's Acumen, SEMA, uh, uh, many. Uh, MC is coming into the space. There's a lot of new investors who are coming on and those who have been in the space and really are the pioneers like Acumen and like Bamboo Capital, they are the, they are, um, they're going for, you know, larger portfolios now or, or trying to build out their portfolios in many kinds of ways. So, you know, the, this is what I mean about bringing transparency. I mean, they don't know each other. This is also, this is a really interesting thing. People don't know each other uh, and they don't know what, what, um, uh, gradation on the on the capital scale they're actually fulfilling but it in fact that's correct we're trying to figure out how to make make that a little bit more transparent so everyone can see anybody else in the other uh, 
Any closing comments or uh, observations? Yeah, uh, I think this, please, is a, this is a wish um, for the investment community. If we could please beef up our post-investment support. We've talked a lot about capital. Mm -hmm. NEA, money is good, but at the end of the day, um, if we really want to build these companies, and if we use a template from the tech sector, we really fail on the post-investment support that companies need versus, and the, given the expectations we have of them. And, and what does it take for us to learn? What does it take for us to implement, um, given that our margins are smaller, and collaborate on that? Mm -hmm. I, I, want, I want to, it's a great way to kind of uh, wrap up the conversation. What's your name? Emilio, uh, Emilio, your, your question is a good lead in to kind of summarizing and, and closing. And Joe, your point is 100% taken. And I have to say on behalf of Gigawatt that uh, North Fund, FMO, uh, SCAT Tech, and our equity partners in our, in our Rwanda project have been terrific in terms of the, the post-investment um, accompanying us, uh, and partially because it was the first commercial scale field in mm -hmm. sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, partly because it was the first field uh, under the rubric of Power Africa, and I want to mention that, Emilio, in response to, you said the, the USAID, the US government has an initiative called Power Africa, uh, whose goal is to bring more electricity to Africa, and, and they have lists of the, the investors and investment funds and, and banks and what have you that are most actively involved in the sector. So there are tools out there, and I would say on a practical basis, and I want to end on a, on a positive note, um, I learned from McKinsey um, that of the $3 trillion expected to be overseen by uh, private equity firms in two years, in 2020, $3 trillion only that's the negative part, but there's a positive element here. <laughs> Only 10% of that is going to go to uh, impact investing type of investments. Well, that only 10% is, if you do the math, because I didn't, that's why I wrote it down here, is $300 billion. $300 billion, not $2 billion that you were just talking about. Of course, I'm not referring, they weren't referring only to energy or not only to Africa. $300 billion is going to be available, is going to be mandated for impact investment in the next two years. If we, the funding community, the collaboration organizations like, like Shine, the companies, can get together and have these conversations and discussions in order for the companies to provide what the funders need, the funders to see what the companies need and be more responsive and perhaps less conservative, um, I think that we're going to see a transition, really a transformational period in the next few years um, and I want to thank you all for your involvement, for your active involvement, not just on the panel, but in, in your life's work in helping to bring more renewable energy to Africa. Um, thank you very much for listening, and let's go enjoy the party that's down the, down the road. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.